tonight, a lot of the East Coast is straight up disappearing behind this dangerous haze of orange smoke. Look at this. I want to show you New York and D.C. What was the Washington Monument at one point now totally blocked out by the world's worst air pollution from those Canadian wildfires. Planes can't take off. Schools had shut down. Full on environmental crisis. We're live almost literally in the thick of it. We're also live in Iowa where Mike Pence is kicking off his 2024 campaign by slamming, in his words, his former running mate. That's Donald Trump. Trump. How Pence is trying to use the January 6th attack down to his Wi-Fi password to show he's the right guy for the job. Then in tonight's breakdown, in the next 24 hours, the lead suspect in a murder case that drew headlines around the world set to be brought back to the U.S. after two decades. We are live in Peru ahead of Jorn Vandersloot's extradition. Plus, why the parent of one Parkland shooting victim walked out of court tonight in the trial of the ex-resource officer on the scene that day. And a new volcano warning in the Pacific. Check it out right here. The lava flow from Kilauea. We've got the danger. You can see that and the drama later on in the show. Hey there, I'm Hallie, and we're coming on the air with problems with the air. Dangerous pollution that's making it harder for almost 100 million of us to breathe. Ground stops at some airports. New York City right now tonight has the worst air quality in the world, in the world. Look at this here. This is a live look right now at the New York skyline. The Big Apple kind of becoming the Big Orange at some points, all because of smoke from those huge Canadian wildfires drifting down across the border. You're looking at it right here. It's creating what New York's governor calls an emergency crisis. Check out Newark Airport live. Delays there because the visibility has been so bad. There was a ground stop earlier over at LaGuardia. And check out the progression, right? What it looked like Monday versus what it looked like today. Monday on top, same shot today on the bottom. It's affecting a ton beyond just the flights. We're seeing code reds in multiple states, schools up and down the East Coast canceling stuff like recess and after school sports. The MLB just postponed games tonight in both New York and Philly. And on Broadway, the lead actor in a show stopped the performance 10 minutes in because it was so hard for her to breathe. Look at how the plumes of smoke are drifting down from up north. You can see it in this animation. It's making it a problem now for people from the Midwest down to the Carolinas, up into New England. And we are covering every angle tonight. Our meteorologist Bill Karens is standing by, along with Tom Costello, watching all things plane-related. Emily Aketa is live for us in New Jersey. We'll go to her first. Emily, obviously you have your mask on. This is a dangerous situation now. A lot of warnings to stay inside. Give us a sense of what it's like and what you're hearing from experts. Hey there, Hallie. Well, my backdrop that you're seeing behind me speaks volumes about the kind of conditions people are up against. I'll tell you this, typically from where I'm standing, you should be able to make out the New York City skyline, including the Empire State Building, but we have seen smoke completely obstruct the view throughout the day. Also, the smell, incredibly pungent, the smell of smoke. And as you mentioned, I'm taking the precaution of wearing a mask to help prevent some of those smoke particles from inhaling them. And I'm seeing a lot of other people take similar measures because the onset of symptoms come Comes on quite quickly. You think about watery eyes, scratchy throat. For some people, especially with pre-existing conditions, that could even mean more difficulty breathing. And as I mentioned, those more vulnerable populations, those are the ones that have medical experts are really speaking out to and encouraging to spend more time indoors and limiting time outside. And so uh, among them are those with asthma, those respiratory conditions. We spoke with one doctor who's seeing an influx of asthmatic patients as we see this really horrible air quality continue to hover over the New York City area. Also, who people who are at increased risk, young children, seniors, and expecting mothers. I spoke with one expecting mom who says she is staying inside all day to keep her, her baby safe. Take a listen here. I'm not going anywhere. I was supposed to teach in Manhattan, um, you know, which involves a lot of walking around, waiting for the train, maybe waiting for a bus. Um, and it just didn't seem worth it today. And keep in mind, this is not even Canada's peak wildfire season, and that's causing a bit of alarm among some medical experts because this could be just a sign of what's to come for the rest of the summer, Hallie. Emily Aketa live for us there in Hoboken. You should be able to see the Manhattan skyline behind you. We obviously cannot an indication of just how bad it is. Emily, thanks. That visibility, Tom Costello, is part of why there are major problems now for flights from the Midwest to the East Coast. These delays yeah, right. piling up. What's it look like? We had, a, we had a ground stop earlier today at LaGuardia. The FAA has lifted that, but we've now got significant ground delays. Uh, in fact, I just checked with FlightAware. 2,700 delays nationwide right now. Only 193 canceled 
cancellation. So flights are eventually leaving for the most part. Uh, Newark Airport right now, as I look at my notes, we've now got a ground delay. They're now averaging 82 minutes uh, for departures there. LaGuardia right now is averaging an hour and 20 minutes. Make it two hours more or less. There's a shot of Reagan Airport. So obviously affected here at Reagan as well. And Reagan Airport right now is also averaging delays uh, of about 20, I believe. So Newark, LaGuardia, Boston, uh, pardon me, Philly, those are the most affected airports. But even Orlando is affected at this point and Charlotte. Why, you say? Because those are major, major American Airlines hubs. And so when you've got essentially a, a huge delay happening at LaGuardia, you're seeing the ripple effect nationwide, and that's mm -hmm. going to continue uh, into, the e into the entire evening. Let me just spout out, if you don't mind, quickly the top and most affected airports. It's LaGuardia, it's, Air it's uh, Newark, and then Charlotte, Toronto. Let's not forget, you know, right across the border, they have a huge right. amount of traffic that goes in and out of the United States. Toronto, Reagan Airport. And then tomorrow, we do expect that as the storm Pardon me, you can see where my mind is. As this weather effect, the, the smoke moves into the D.C. area, that we're going to see this impact on Reagan, on uh, Baltimore, Washington Airport, as well as on Dulles Airport. Uh, the reason I'm thinking that way is because almost always when we talk about major delays and cancellations like this, it's weather related, right? right? It's either significant uh, rain or snow, and the ripple effect is the same nationwide, and this is happening now as the travel season kicks into high gear. Tom Costello, thank you very much. Meteorologist Bill Cairns is with us, and you heard Tom say it, right? You usually forecast storms and rain. You are now forecasting smoke, Bill. When's it going to get better? Uh, it'll get a lot better by Saturday, and everyone's like, okay. wait, Saturday? That's like a bunch of days from now. Yeah, a lot of people were like, okay, two days, we can deal with it, but we're not done. So this was the really dense stuff. So we've had reports from Charlotte, northern Georgia, all the way through Michigan. There's been reports of haze and smoke in the sky. You know, the moon and the sun looks a little different. But this dark haze you see right here that has settled over New York City this afternoon, this was really thick, and we'll just call this a hazardous smoke plume. That's how the air has been all day from Syracuse to Finger Lakes, down through Binghamton, uh, Pocono, Scranton, uh, Allentown, Harrisburg, and now over New York City. It just made its way into Philadelphia, and that's where the really dangerous stuff is. And you can see that on our map here, because we have all air monitors. We do have 93 million people in unhealthy air, but when we get up here to the very unhealthy and what we call hazardous, and when we say hazardous, we're not just talking about like respiratory people, illnesses or children or elderly. We're talking ha hazardous for anyone to be outside. That's this entire region region here into New York and now heading for Philadelphia. The air quality right now in New York is worse than it's ever been. It's worse than yesterday, which broke the record. It's now at 392 particles. You know, when we talk about that, you know, Hallie, when it gets above 150, usually we say, oh, that's kind of unhealthy and right. dangerous. We're double that right now. You notice that D.C. is at 160. Tomorrow, you're likely going to see your worst air quality in the D.C. area. That should yeah. be somewhere in the 200. So just be prepared. The mayor of New York City talking about the climate connection bill. Let me play that. This may be the first time we've experienced something like this on this magnitude. Let's be clear. It is not the last. Right. Is this something people on the East Coast will have to get used to living with, right? You look at what happens in California where the wildfire fire seasons have gotten hotter, longer, and more intense. Obviously, it's not wildfires causing this in the, in the U.S., it's the ones in Canada. But can you talk about the way that the climate crisis is playing into this? In other words, are we seeing the local and state-level impacts now of regional climate change? Yeah, so here's the map of all the fires in Canada that we've had. had. And right now, they are six times more fires for this time of year than they should be. So that's the reason and they just got done with the hottest spring ever so it is all connected the hottest spring dry spring that's why all of these fires have formed and that's why we are now dealing with it you know would these fires have happened without climate change likely but it's, everything's on steroids now Hallie every weather event every extreme climate event is worse than it should be because of climate change Bill Karens, thank you for tracking all of that. Appreciate it. I'm sure we'll be talking much more over the next 24 hours. To Iowa now, where Mike Pence is officially jumping into the race for the White House in just the last few hours, going up against his former boss, Donald Trump, for that GOP nomination. And the ex-VP calling Mr. Trump his former running mate is trying to make the case that he's the right guy for the job, partly because of how he stood up to Donald Trump's pressure campaign to try to get Pence to overturn the legit results of the 2020 election. I believe that anyone who puts themselves over the Constitution should never be president of the United States. 
and anyone who asks someone else to put them over the Constitution should never be president of the United States again. He is serious about that message, right down to the rollout's Wi-Fi password. You see it here. Kept his oath. The question is, are voters serious about Mike Pence? Because here are the numbers. With the caveat that it is early days yet, folks, but he is at just about 3%, has hardly moved over the last six months. Dasha Burns is in Iowa for us tonight. Uh, empty room, Dasha, but Mike Pence is just getting on the campaign trail now officially, right? It's just starting, and so are the attacks against him. You already have a super PAC backing Donald Trump, saying that a lot of GOP voters are asking one question about Pence's candidacy, which is, why? So explain the why from the Pence team here and from Mike Pence. We heard some of it today. Well, look, Hallie, the why actually has to do with the issue that might be his biggest contrast with the former president and his biggest liability, and that is January 6th. In his address to voters today, he really went directly to that day, walked everyone through what happened, and laid down some of his sharpest criticisms yet of former President Trump, his former boss. Take a listen. President Trump was wrong then. And he's wrong now. I will always believe, by God's grace, I did my duty that day. I kept my oath to ensure the peaceful transfer of power under the Constitution of the United States. Look, this is an issue that the campaign knows looms over his candidacy. It might even loom over his legacy in the Republican Party overall. So the idea seems to be that the only way out is through. They have to take this mm -hmm. issue head on, and they might even be using it as a way to sort of bolster his conservative bona fides, his, his roots in constitutionalism, which is kind of what he laid out for voters here today. If he's going to do well anywhere in this Republican primary, it would be in Iowa, where you mm. are, right? He's talking about his Midwest connections yeah. today. He's probably going to look to connect with the religious right in Iowa as a man of deep faith himself. It seems like Team Pence knows that Iowa, in some ways, is ballgame for them. Yeah, it is Iowa or bust, Hallie. He needs to do well here, and they see this as the most fertile ground for his kind of brand of traditional faith-based republicanism. And today, one of the other criticisms that he levied against his former boss was on the issue of abortion. Again, sort of playing towards that evangelical crowd, of which uh, there are a lot of evangelical vo voters here. He's hoping to connect on that faith-based approach and on that issue of, of abortion. He said that the former president is sort of returning treating and questioned sort of his his move to the the left on on the issue here and again that's something that's really striking that he hasn't done before when it comes to his his uh his a former running mate and yeah. former boss and the campaign does plan to go to all 99 counties in Iowa. They say they plan to visit all 70 plus pizza ranches here. That is going to be the approach, <laughs> Iowa or bust, Hallie. I, I feel like maybe you and I have both been to all 70 plus of those pizza ranches as well. Here's the thing, though, right? We talked about how Donald Trump is in some ways looking past Mike Pence already. Same with Ron DeSantis, who's down at the border in Arizona today for this quasi surprise trip. Mm -hmm. He is focused on going after the current president, President Biden. Listen. You're the president. You would think that you would take a sense of pride in ensuring that the territorial integrity of your country is actually respected. Those close to Donald Trump are going after DeSantis for this, saying that he's the one who can't be trusted to secure the border. It seems like that is the broader play here on both sides, to bring it back mm -hmm. to a Donald Trump versus Ron DeSantis showdown in this primary. Yeah, Hallie, you know I've been following uh, Governor DeSantis a lot, too, mm -hmm. and I have not heard him really talk about any other candidates except former President Trump and, of course, President Joe Biden. He's, his campaign sees this as a two-man race, and when I talk to voters, those are really the only two names that come up, Trump and DeSantis. To be fair to all the other candidates, though, it's very early, and we know a lot say. can happen even before the first uh, the Iowa caucuses here, Hallie. We simply cannot issue that caveat enough, especially when it is early uh, summer, late spring of 2023. Dasha Burns, thank you very much. Appreciate it. Just into us tonight, former President Donald Trump says, you see it here, I'm quoting here, no one has told me I'm being indicted. You can see it here as he posted to his Truth Social account in just the last couple of hours. All of it, apparently, it seems a pushback to some of the reporting that suggests perhaps charges could be coming soon in the special counsel investigation 
and Mr. Trump's alleged mishandling of those classified documents found at Mar-a-Lago. Of course, that question is still an open one tonight. If and when the former president and current Republican frontrunner for the race for the White House could face federal charges. I want to get to Garrett Hake. So here we have Donald Trump coming out and saying, nobody's told me I'm going to be indicted. Nobody's told us he's going to be indicted, right, as far as members of the media. He seems to be pushing back on perhaps some of the reporting speculating it could come soon. Lots of things bubbling tonight. Where do we stand? Lots of things bubbling, Hallie. Let's start in Florida and work our way northeast here, okay? This Miami grand jury today, which we only learned about within the last couple of days, today heard from a top Trump aide very briefly, Taylor Budovich, who was a uh, part of the Trump's PAC now, but was really Trump's only political aide for a little while after he left the White House, testified before this Florida grand jury only for about an hour. They had very specific questions for him uh, about this classified documents case and sort of one statement that he had drafted and then decided not to send about whether or not Trump knew he had classified documents, okay? It's the kind of thing that legal experts look at and say, that's not a very long interview. That doesn't feel like they're, you know, kind of starting this out. This looks like they're buttoning things up. Now, when you take that in connection with all the other little bits and bobs that have started to leak out here about Mark Meadows having potentially testified, something we've not yet confirmed at NBC, and then this reporting that led to a phone call to Donald Trump that led to a tweet about, you know, not having been told directly that he's being indicted. All of this starts to look very familiar. It starts to look like exactly how Mr. Trump and his allies acted just before his indictment was announced in New York. Right down to the last line of the post you just showed, which wasn't highlighted, the idea that Republicans in Congress need to make this their key issue. We have seen Trump signaling on indictments since March in New York. Right. And now again here, when he thinks he's in trouble, he starts to try to get out in front of it. In this case, denying the indictment has happened, but pivoting to this idea of election interference interference and trying to rally Republicans to his side, trying to split people basically and say, you're either on my side as a good Republican or on the side of these election interfering liberal prosecutors. It has become a playbook and we're seeing it uh, play out right in front of our eyes. It has become in some ways, Garrett, a preemptive defense to news that hasn't even dropped yet. And by the way, maybe, may never. Yeah, exactly right. I mean, we don't know what's going on in, entirely in these grand juries. It's a secret process. They could decide to charge. They could decide not to charge. Yeah. But what we are seeing is a very intentional political response from Donald Trump and his allies to inoculate him against this. I mean, he has made it pretty clear up until now, and we'll see if he's able to continue to do this, that politically speaking, in indictments, prosecutions, investigations, going back to Bob Mueller's day through now, he casts as political efforts to come after him. He's putting money behind it in right. a television ad that he released today. Just gonna say, and so he's just preparing you, that yep. ground. He's preparing that ground for that possibility if and when it comes. He'll be able to make the same political argument he's made to great success so far. Garrett Haig, thank you very much. Appreciate it. Tonight, a suspect's in custody, pleading not guilty to murder charges in that shooting after a high school graduation ceremony in Virginia. It comes as we're getting a new look at the very scary moments right as it was happening. Watch. Ugh. You hear the gunshots, right? You hear people start to run. Whoever's holding that phone obviously drops it, tries to get to safety as everybody's out there celebrating with these graduates. That's when everything changes. People start running, right? Five people ended up hurt. Two people ended up killed. The victims, a father and son, Sean Jackson and his dad, Renzo Smith. Police say this appeared to have been a targeted attack. Jackson, you see him here, he's just 18. This is him walking across stage during that ceremony, just minutes before the shooting, in a video posted to Instagram. He had just gotten his diploma. His mom telling NBC she was so proud of him because he had overcome so much to get there, something that was echoed by the school district's superintendent. Getting to the graduation stage was not easy for Sean. Nonetheless, he did it. And he was rightly proud, smiling, and celebrating like all of his peers. Aaron Gilchrist is joining us now. And Aaron, um, Jackson's mom says the family got separated in the crowd right before the shooting happened. You are there outside the theater at the location of this. What, what else are we learning now? Well, Hallie, as we understand it from the police chief here, the suspect in this uh, incident, 19-year-old Damari Pollard, was inside the theater watching the graduation ceremony as it happened today. After the ceremony ended, he came outside, according to police, and exchanged words, they said, with 
uh, with the young man who had just graduated, who died here, Sean Jackson. Uh, at, at some point after that exchange, police say Pollard went to his car, retrieved a handgun, came back and started shooting. Uh, as you noted, seven people were wounded here, or seven people were shot here, two people died. Uh, Jackson and his stepfather. Uh, and this was a chaotic scene that sent people running in all directions. Several people tried to run back into the theater to get away from the gunfire. It was described as a stampede here. I want you to hear a little bit of what the mayor had to say today about what happened here and what needs to happen moving forward. I know many are overcome with grief, and I know that many are very angry right now. Well, let me be clear to Richmonders. We will heal, we will recover, and this will not break us. There were hundreds of people outside the theater here and in the park across the street after the ceremony. Hallie, as you noted, taking pictures, uh, hugging each other, celebrating this special day for these young people. That incident now marred, and there's going to be a long road to recovery for the hundreds of people who witnessed what happened here after that graduation ceremony yesterday. Can you tell us more about what police are describing as this sort of, what they say, ongoing dispute in this instance here? We know that this is a shooting that has affected the community very deeply. School um, activities are canceled in Richmond Public Schools, several of them. Um, but talk to us about this piece related to this suspect who you've just described and, and the victims here. Yeah, police say that the suspect and the victim who died here, the young man who died here, knew each other. They had had at least a year-long dispute, the police chief said, uh, going on here. And so today, it, or yeah, rather yesterday, it culminated with that confrontation outside the theater here and ultimately ended in the shooting. Police are still investigating. They're asking the public to share any video that they may have taken during the time out here uh, yesterday. They're still trying to piece together exactly what happened and try to get a better understanding of why this happened, which is the same for so many families out here. Hallie, I can tell you, I, I'm a Richmond Public Schools graduate. Uh, my sister graduated in this building right behind me here. Wow. Uh, this is not something that people for generations who graduated in this building would ever expect to see. And so it's going to take some time for this community to come to grips with what's happened and to heal. Aaron Gilchrist, thank you so much for your perspective and for your reporting there live from Richmond. Appreciate it. To Rome now. Pope Francis out of surgery tonight and recovering at a hospital in Italy after a procedure to fix a hernia, with the Vatican saying no complications. The Pope is set to stay in the hospital for a few days for recovery. The second time, by the way, that he's been hospitalized in just over two months. That's bringing up some new questions about how he's doing health-wise generally. Before he headed to the hospital, you see it here, Pope Francis held his weekly general audience, as scheduled, in St. Peter's Square. But everything else on his plate is on hold, at least for another 10 days or so. Megan Fitzgerald is joining us now live from Rome. N not emergency surgery per se, Megan, but it is serious surgery, especially for somebody who, as the Pope is, is in his mid-80s. He's had recent medical issues. He's talked publicly about not responding well after general anesthesia for a different surgery on his colon in 2021. Where do things stand tonight and where do they go? Yeah, you're absolutely right to point out all of that. Uh, the prognosis for right now is that he should rest. He was going to be resting in the hospital for several days, uh, not to do any heavy lifting. Uh, and what we know is that he has been in a lot of pain over the last several months because of this hernia that formed on a scar, presumably from that 2021 surgery. Now, keep in mind, doctors say that's not an uncommon thing to see, but it is pretty painful. Uh, we had an opportunity to hear from one of his doctors earlier today, a snippet he uh, uh, talked in English, and I want to play that for you. Take a listen. Surgical operation and the general anesthesia were well tolerated by the Pope. Now he's awake, he's uh, fine, and he's uh, already at work. All right, so now to give you a little bit of a recent chronology of events for the Pope, yesterday uh, he went to the hospital for some tests. He then went back to the Vatican. He presided over his audience. He did the same thing earlier today, uh, even held some meetings. He seemed to be in good form. He then went to the hospital for this surgery. And as you just heard from his doctor, he's doing well. He's ready to get back to work, Hallie. He, he's ready to get back to work, and he's got a pretty full schedule ahead of him. He's supposed to go to Portugal later this summer, supposed to visit Mongolia. There's also now speculation, as there has been, I think, for a little while, of potential retirement. How likely is that? What are you hearing from these Vatican watchers, people who are reading the tea leaves? 
Yeah, you know, you're absolutely right. That uh, schedule, by the way, was just released yesterday. It is pretty heavy. I mean, he's going to be doing this in October, in August, rather, which is just a couple of months away. Over the course of his papacy, he has said a lot of different things. When he first uh, took the job, he said that he was only going to be uh, pope for only a couple of years. Uh, then, of course, we heard him say that if his health started to fail him, that he would consider retiring. Most recently, we've heard him say that this is a life mission. Uh, and that he has no intention of retiring. So if you go off of what he's recently said, it certainly appears as though he plans to stay as Pope until the end, Tally. Megan Fitzgerald, live for us in Rome. Megan, thank you so much for being there. Appreciate it. To Ukraine now with new concerns tonight after a very important dam collapsed in the southern region of Ukraine, putting something like 100,000 people at risk of this humanitarian and ecological disaster, by the way, on top of the Russian invasion of Ukraine already. Three big concerns here. The first, evacuations, especially in the city of Kherson. President Zelensky's chief of staff saying today the situation there is the biggest concern. There's another problem, right? The UN warning of the potential of diseases maybe be getting spread, partly because there's so many chemicals now in the water. That leads us to the third thing. People do not have clean drinking water. People who are stuck now, look at this drone. That's what that video is, delivering a bottle of water to somebody. This whole thing's also having a pretty big impact on wildlife. Hundreds of dead fish lining the banks of this reservoir because the water levels are so low after that dam collapse. Ukraine is pointing the finger at Russia for this. Russia pointing the finger back at Ukraine. Josh Letterman is joining us now. What's the plan, Josh, moving forward? Well, we have some unfortunate but not surprising news to share tonight, Hallie. It had been suspected but not confirmed, right, that people had died as a result of this uh, my, this list, uh, this dam collapsing. Uh, tonight, we know that is true. The mayor of the town of Oleshki, which is in that Kherson region that you mentioned, confirming that there were fatalities. He is not saying exactly how many at this point, but now the evacuation effort is underway to try to prevent more fatalities uh, from the, the, the bombing and the, the destruction of this dam. And the top concern of the International Organization for Migration, which is part of the United Nations, is that waterborne disease risk that you mentioned. And so they are rushing clean water as well as hygiene and sanitation kits uh, to people who are affected. The U.S. Agency for International Development doing very similar work. They have teams on the ground and are also working to try to support the the state uh, emergency service of Ukraine, which is really doing a lot of that nitty gritty work on the ground there. But then you have the fact that all of these people trying to evacuate are coming under some of case, some of them shelling while they are trying to do so because they're in the middle of this war zone. And so you have people making this impossible choice, Hallie. Am I safer staying put even as in some areas the flood waters continue to rise? Or am I safer trying to evacuate and possibly uh, finding myself in the crossfire of this ongoing war. One other thing that we're watching very, very closely is the risk of landmines, with the Red Cross saying that many of the landmines that they knew where they were before have washed away as a result of that, uh, th that dam collapsing, and now nobody knows where those landmines are, Hallie. Josh Letterman, thank you very much for that. Still ahead for us this hour, the huge fight, the brawl, basically, outside the school board meeting in California. We'll tell you why, what caused it all, coming up as you're looking at some of the aftermath here. Plus, later, a big shakeup in the sports world. Do you know where Lionel Messi is heading next? He's taking his talents. Well, that's coming up in a bit. So tonight, shares of CNN's parent company are up something like 8% after that pretty extraordinary twist that former, now former President Chris Licht is officially out as the head of the news organization after a one-year run as chairman and CEO. His departure comes as CNN is dealing with a lot, like shrinking profits, low ratings that reportedly dipped even below Newsmax in the days after that town hall with Donald Trump last month. And then most recently, that damning article in The Atlantic calling Licht's leadership into question, it dropped just five days ago. Here we are now. It revealed Lick's mission to, I'm quoting here, restore the network's reputation for serious journalism and asking, how did it all go wrong? Listen, the move from CNN matters, not just for CNN, but for the industry more broadly, because his departure after those reported attempts to try to move the news brand more to the political center is raising questions about 
CNN's future was once seen as a pioneer, a hallmark in the cable news world. Where does it go next? Stephanie Gosk is joining us now. And Steph, I'm going to just be super honest with you. Yeah. I think this is, this is like an interesting story for us to cover because it runs the risk of being really navel-gazy. We all know people yeah. who work at CNN. We all know what CNN, we work in this media industry. But there is um, like a relevant impact to people who simply consume perhaps broadcast news, cable news, streaming news, as it relates to the fall of Chris Licht in this particular position. For sure, Hallie. And, and listen, the, like it or not, the media has become part of our national conversation. And it, people care about it, and they want to know where they're going to get their news from. And, and this effort to move CNN towards the middle, after what a lot of people saw as a real partisan turn during the Trump years, deserves some analysis. But also, you have to look at the controversies that played out over the course of the 13 months that Lick was there, the most important of which really was the revamping of that morning show. And what he did in the morning was he took Poppy Harlow, a, a veteran at CNN, along with Caitlin Collins, an up and rising um, former White House correspondent, and put them with Don Lemon, a real lightning rod in their primetime lineup. They had a tough time right out of the gate, and then Lemon said some disparaging things about women during a live broadcast, and he, eventually he was out. The other thing to look at that happened that, that Licht was very much involved in was that Donald Trump town hall that really kind of turned into a rally. You had Caitlin Collins trying to mon monitor it, and, and it kind of went off the rails, and you had a whole bunch of really staunch Trump supporters cheering him on, and he repeated a lot of the same things that we've been hearing about election fraud that are totally unverified and went kind of unchecked over the course of that period of time. Then comes this Atlantic article with unbelievable access, really, to Chris Licht over an extensive period of time, uh, and now the announcement today that he's out. Stephanie Gosk, a lot to watch, lots to follow. As you point out, broader impact on this. We'll watch to see what happens. Thank you, friend. Appreciate it. You're welcome. Let's take it to California now, where there is this brawl, kind of, this big fight between protesters outside of a school board meeting there as the school board was voting on whether to recognize June as Pride Month. Look at this. You had hundreds of demonstrators showing up, big crowds, right? Police, and this video is tough to see from this angle, but at one point there were these clashes. Police tried to break it up in Glendale. The police say some people escalated what had been peaceful protests. They tried and could not disperse, disperse the crowd several times. They tried to step in, couldn't do it. Eventually, people left. No injuries reported. Three people arrested. The board eventually unanimously voted to recognize Pride Month, with the district saying in a statement that intentionally and harmful disinformation had been circulating about what's being taught there. They said that all their LGBTQ plus curriculum and policies are guided by California law. I want to bring in Miguel Almaguer, who's been following this. The district has done a resolution like this for years. I mean, this is not the first year they were trying to get something like this passed. What happened? How did things get so, and I want to say heated. I know the video doesn't reflect like a crazy explosive. It was sort of bananas for the people who were there as they describe it. Yeah, and there's a bunch of different video, Hallie, that we're seeing from the scene. It really does show it was quite heated and at times pretty violent. Initially, police say the gathering started out peacefully. Protesters and LGBTQ activists had gathered outside that school board meeting after calls for both sides to show up kind of materialized. Police say agitators on, quote, both sides then got out of hand and escalated into fighting. It appears punches were thrown and folks were even kicked after hitting the ground. As you mentioned, three people were arrested and later, after declaring an unlawful assembly, everyone cleared out. Now, the school board says the curriculum they teach is mandated by state law, and they've been teaching it for over a decade. Here's what they said. It should be clear. When you're placing your kids in taxpayer-funded public school, it should be clear what they're getting educated on. If there is concern with that, they're barking up the wrong tree here, disrupting the movement of what is happening in Glendale Unified School District. The school district says it's shocked and it's surprised that there would be outcry now, 10 years after they began teaching this, Hallie. So they were taken by surprise by all of this. It, it, pull back. Give us the macro look, right? Because we've talked a lot on this show about fights over Pride Month, right? F we've seen it from the business world. Now we're obviously seeing it in the world of education. That is not something that is necessarily new to Glendale here. 
Yeah, the last time we were together, Hallie, here in Los Angeles, we were talking about Budweiser and Target who right. were being targeted. Well, in Glendale and in many other cities where protests and fights have broken out, officials say misinformation is behind so much of this. Misinformation over what's being taught or even celebrated. This is also a hot button issues with culture way with culture wars underway. It seems pride events in cities nationwide have been under attack. In fact, the human rights campaign declared a state of emergency for the LGBT community saying that the current political climate is getting so heated and so out of hand, Hallie. Miguel Almaguer, live for us there in California. Thanks, Miguel. Appreciate it. Let's get you over to the five things our team thinks you should know about tonight. First, an update to a story we told you about 24 hours ago. Florida police have arrested the white woman accused of shooting and killing her black neighbor through a door last week. She's been charged with manslaughter, as well as some other counts. Officials are still not sure when she will make her first court appearance. We'll keep you posted. Number two, Supreme Court Justice Clarence Thomas wants an extension on his annual financial disclosure ahead of tomorrow's deadlines. We've told you about some of the reports that he got pretty swank trips from billionaire GOP donor Harlan Crow for years. But the justice never disclosed those trips on his forms. Justice Samuel Alito has also requested an extension. Number three, Prince Harry. Now the first member of the royal family to testify in court in 130 years, taking the stand in his lawsuit against the publishers of the tabloid Daily Mirror over the accusations they hacked his voicemail. He got emotional toward the end of testimony, telling court it's been a lot. Number four, Columbia University is dropping out of the annual U.S. News and World Report rankings for undergrad schools. So Columbia is now the first big school to do just that, saying it was worried about the outsized influence that these rankings have in the application process. Columbia already withdrew its law school and med school from the list. And U.S. News and World Report has been under a lot of fire, a lot of criticism for the way it puts its rankings together. Number five, scientists announcing for the first time ever they've documented a female crocodile laying eggs without mating. They say she'd been in isolation away from any males for 16 years. Remember, crocodiles are some of the closest living relatives to dinosaurs. Um, this was a big, I'm just gonna, this was a plot point in the movie Jurassic Park, right? If this sounds familiar to you, I'm merely the messenger, but a development, there you go. Up next, in tonight's breakdown, the longtime prime suspect in that high profile disappearance of Natalie Holloway, now fighting his extradition to the US, which is supposed to happen tomorrow. We'll get into why this case is once again capturing the attention of so many people around the world and what happens from here. Tonight, the main suspect in one of the most high profile disappearances ever is fighting his extradition to the US. An extradition that is supposed to happen in just the next 24 hours. We're talking about the guy you see here, Jorn van der Sloot, one of the last people seen with Natalie Holloway before she disappeared while on a high school graduation trip to Aruba back in 2005. He faces fraud charges for a case connected to Holloway's disappearance. Remember, it's her story that captivated so many people in this country, dominated headlines for months, with so many questions still not answered nearly 20 years later. Wad Venegas explains it for us in tonight's breakdown. It was a case that gripped the nation. There was still no sign of Natalie Holloway. Natalie Holloway has been missing. New help in the search for missing teenager Natalie Holloway. Alabama teenager Natalie Holloway, only 18 years old, mysteriously vanished on her high school graduation trip to Aruba almost two decades ago, a chilling case that is still unsolved. The story of her 2005 disappearance captured worldwide attention, covering magazines, sparking documentaries, and even being turned into to dramatic movies. Her cell phone. She doesn't have her with her. Police say this man, Joran van der Sloot, was with Holloway the night she vanished. He was arrested twice and then released both times, but never charged in her disappearance. Holloway was officially declared dead years later in 2012. Her body never found. But her mother, Beth Holloway, never stopped searching. I will pursue this with every ounce of energy that I have. And Vandersloot is the man she blames for her daughter's death. He was later arrested and convicted for the murder of a different woman in Peru, where he's serving a 28-year sentence. But he's said to be extradited to the U.S. soon, not for any murder charges, but in connection to a fraud case. Extradition is just a process where one jurisdiction asks another jurisdiction to turn over someone in that other jurisdiction. Vandersloot's lawyer says he's fighting the extradition. 
It's alleged he led Holloway's mother to wire $25,000 to him in exchange for information on where Natalie's body was and details on her death. The accusation says Vandersloot claimed to know the site in Aruba where Holloway's remains were buried. But federal prosecutors say that's a lie. An FBI agent says Vandersloot's plot involved trying to get a quarter of a million dollars from Holloway's grieving mother. But Vandersloot's lawyer tells NBC News Vandersloot is actually the one who was tricked. He says Natalie's mother, alongside a journalist, promised Vandersloot they'd give him $250,000. Beth Holloway's spokesperson tells NBC NBC News, the allegations are, quote, patently untrue. In a recent statement, Natalie's mother, writing in part, quote, it has been a very long and painful journey, but the persistence of many is going to pay off. Together, we are finally getting justice for Natalie. The case, once again, set to capture headlines around the world decades later. Guad Venegas is joining us now live from Peru. Okay, Guad, as you report now, Jorn Vandersloot's lawyer is trying to make sure he is not actually extradited. That is supposed to happen within the next 24 hours. How does this get resolved? What is going to happen? It is, Hallie. So according to government officials here in Peru, the extradition is set to happen tomorrow, June 8th, uh, June 8th, he is currently at a detention center north of Lima. He was transferred from the maximum security prison where he was serving that 28-year sentence. Just days ago, he was brought to the Lima area. All of this to move forward with the extradition. So as of now, according to Peruvian officials, he will be extradited to face these charges in the United States. That could happen at any point uh, tomorrow. So we will be here paying attention, Hallie, uh, to witness that extradition. He's expected to be driven from that detention detention center to the Lima airport and from there be flown to Alabama where he will face mm. uh, the fraud and extradition uh, charges, Hallie. Guad Venegas live for us there in Lima. Guad, glad to have you there. Thank you very much for that reporting. Coming up here on the show, a difficult day relived in a Florida courtroom. The incredibly emotional start to the trial of a man accused of not following his training when a shooter attacked Parkland. We'll be right back. In court today, the family members of victims of the Parkland shooting walking out, one of them, while listening to audio of shots fired, children screaming. They're there for the trial of the man you're about to see, Scott Peterson. He's the former school resource deputy who was on duty during the shooting five years ago. He's now accused of failing to follow his training and go and confront the attacker by staying in a cover position for something like 45 minutes. 14 students and three staffers were killed in the shooting. You see their names and faces here. But the state's first witness today, a former student, Danielle Gilbert, a junior at the time. Did you know that Deputy C. Peterson carried a firearm? I did, yes. Did Deputy Peter Peterson ever enter your classroom that day? He did not. Did he ever enter the hallway? He did not. Did you ever see Deputy Peterson assist any students that day? I did not. Lindsay Reiser is joining us now. And Lindsay, in the five years since the Parkland school shooting happened, Scott Peterson has been in many ways at the epicenter of the intense criticism for not doing more sooner. This was a huge headline in the weeks and months after the attack. And this trial has enormous implications, Hallie. Yeah. We're going to show you the charges that he's facing right now. We've got seven counts of child neglect, three counts of culpable negligence, one count of perjury. He's accused of lying to officials. And according to the Association of School Resource Officers, they believe this is the first case of its kind in which an officer in the U.S. is being tried for allegedly not acting in a school shooting. And so prosecutors allege... We know that Scott Peterson was the only one on Marjorie Stoneman Douglas campus in 2018 with a handgun. They allege that instead of going to the building to apprehend the shooter, to confront the shooter, he hid sort of in an alcove behind a wall. For about 48 minutes, he stayed there. And so they allege that his action, or rather inaction, um, led to potential harm by these victims, that he could have prevented more bloodshed. We know 17 people, as you mentioned, died and 17 more were wounded. 
His defense attorney is essentially saying he's thrown under the bus. They're calling him a scapegoat for the sheriff's office, um, basically covering up um, uh, potential mistakes on their own end. And he also says that he did what he was trained to do, that he thought there were, uh, there were actually shots coming from outside, potentially a sniper. He didn't know where the shots were coming from. And so he said he did what he was trained to do, and that is seek cover. But the prosecution, Hallie, is going to have to prove that he knew those shots were coming from inside that school and that his action or inaction possibly led to more harm. Just incredibly emotional, Lindsay. I mean, the, the audio that was played, what these people who came to court, right, victims, family members of victims had to hear, uh, it's, it's just, it's a gut punch. Yet another gut punch five years later. It's excruciating. It is so hard to listen to. Some people had earplugs in, and you can still sort of tell in some of that audience reaction, they could maybe still hear some of it because their their heads were in their hands. I mean, of yeah. course, it is traumatizing to listen to these children screaming. Um, that first witness that we heard from, who was a student at the time, she said that several students were shot in her classroom, one died, kids were trying to use their, their uh, some kind of clothes and coats to try and stop the bleeding, and that in the she took an audio recording there and all of that. That chaos, and you can hear students um, trying to be quiet, but they are just so, so distraught, of course. And you hear one student saying, Please help me. Um, and then in some of the audio that was played in court today that was tough to listen to, you can hear the gunshots. You can hear just blood-piercing screams, Hallie. And uh, we also heard testimony from a teacher who described the gunshots just being deafening and just completely um, obliterating the classroom. And we also heard from a law enforcement official who said um, th that people are trained in these on-campus shootings to run toward the danger, to run toward the shooter, not away from it. In fact, saying, if you hear gunshots, someone's getting killed. So very powerful testimony today, Hallie. Both opening statements have wrapped. It's still the prosecution's turn tomorrow. Lindsay Reiser, so many people were living that nightmare from five years ago again today. Thank you. NBC News covers hundreds of stories every day. And because you couldn't possibly read or watch or listen to them all, our bureau teams have done it for you. This is what they tell us is going down in their regions in a segment we call The Local. Out of our Northeast Bureau, officials say one person's been killed after a mysterious explosion in New Hampshire that rattled homes. You can see the whole spot was like sealed off. Investigators at one point were putting on those protective suits. Police said they couldn't find any signs of foul play. There are no threats to the broader public. They're still trying to figure out what happened. Out of our Western Bureau, the body of a missing 80-year-old man climbing Mount Rainier alone has now been found. He started hiking May 30th and hadn't been seen since people looked for him on the ground and by helicopter. They were looking for days. He'd been hiking Mount Rainier for the 50th time to celebrate his birthday. And out of our Southern Bureau, big news for football fans, meaning soccer fans, because Lionel Messi says today he's taken his talents to South Beach. He's going to Miami, the MLS team co-owned by another soccer superstar, formerly now David Beckham. Messi said in interviews today that some of the details still need to be worked out, but that he's going to head down south to Florida. Could be a huge deal for soccer in the U.S., not just for the struggling Miami team, but for MLS in general. Talk about a fan draw. We'll see how that goes. Up next, drama big time in Hawaii with lava flowing out of Kilauea in all directions. Look at this, it, look at this, right? The video, the pictures, it's stunning. We'll tell you what the danger is and what people there are doing next. Want to show you right now some live pictures that you are looking at as we speak. That's the lava at Kilauea, the volcano on Hawaii's big island. I'm just looking at my monitor because man, there it is, right? It erupted early today. You can see some of the pictures from the initial eruption, the lava, the smoke shooting up from the crater up into the sky. Happened, obviously, it's dark out really early in the morning in Hawaii. And that is why the alert level has now been raised on the Big Island from a watch to a warning. Now, right now, it's all kind of contained. It's kind of like a fiery cauldron right in Kilauea's crater. It's inside a part of Volcanoes National Park that is closed. And it's a national park, so nobody lives there. No threat to people's property. But there is a threat to people's health, potentially. The concern about, for example, the air quality, potential perhaps to damage crops and livestock because of how much volcanic gas is in the air. Dana Griffin is joining us now. It is an active volcano, Kilauea is. It just erupted not too long ago. At this point, as we say, like it's not like this is 
in the movies, the lava's racing down the side of the mountain, ready to engulf people's right. homes. That's not what this is. The concern really is more, as we know on the East Coast for a very different reason, about the air quality here. Talk us through it. I know when you kind of think about what's happening in New York right now, the same advice probably should be issued to the people in Hawaii because, as you mentioned, it's that volcanic emission emissions that is really concerning here. The gas, you've got glass and also ash, and those trade winds could could move that that ash and, and emissions and affect people's breathing, also irritate the eyes. I will say that the emergency management department there says that luckily it, it seems like the lava flow is only contained to the crater there at the Hali Mau Mau crater where this eruption is still ongoing. Uh, but they're not opening the operating center because they say that this is not as big of a threat you know, as they may have initially thought because, you know, they had the red warning, but right. it, it is contained at this point. They say that this is not as as severe as the 2018 eruption that, you know, destroyed some 700 homes. Mm -hmm. There have been 61 separate eruptions since 1823 and, and the most recent January 5th that lasted for 61 days. So a lot of people are actually looking at this as an opportunity to get to that bigger island to try to see what many are describing That's as right. a spectacular show. One local reporter says he has never seen anything like this in his five years of reporting on volcanic activity. So Hallie, big message here is to stay safe, maybe wear a mask if That's you are sure. going to visit that eruption. Dana Griffin, thank you very much for that. That does it for us this hour. We've got more coverage picking up right now. Tonight, a lot of the East Coast is disappearing behind a dangerous haze of orange smoke. Look at this. That was New York and D.C. at one point. You can see the skyline. You can see the monument blocked out partly by some of the world's worst air pollution now, stemming from those Canadian wildfires. Planes couldn't take off. School activities shutting down. A full-on environmental crisis. We are live in the thick of it. We're also live in Iowa, where Mike Pence is kicking off his 2024 campaign by slamming, in his words, his former running mate. That's this guy, Donald Trump. How Pence is trying to use the January 6th attack right down to his Wi-Fi password to show he's the right guy for the job. Also breaking in literally the last couple of minutes, one of Donald Trump's former top advisors, Steve Bannon, getting his subpoena, we've confirmed, in the special counsel's investigation. We're going to be live with those details in a second. Plus, a Virginia community in shock and in grief tonight after the death of a father and son at his high school graduation. But the victim's family is telling our team tonight about the shooting and about this young man. Plus, more health problems for Pope Francis, now recovering from surgery in a Rome hospital. His team saying he faced no complications. We'll talk about what we know about his condition and his schedule later on in the show. Hey there, I'm Hallie, and we're coming on the air with problems with the air. Dangerous pollution that is making it harder for almost 100 million of us to breathe. Ground stops at least one airport today. New York City right now tonight has the worst air quality in the world. I want to show you this. This is the George Washington Bridge in New York. You can barely, like, that. that is not our color correction. That is orange, the orange haze. The Big Apple now becoming the Big Orange. It's a little less intense tonight. I want to show you a live picture here of New York, but obviously it is still there, all because of that smoke from those huge Canadian wildfires drifting down across the border. That's creating what New York's governor calls an emergency crisis. She's just announcing they're going to hand out masks, a million of them, to people tomorrow across the state. Take a live look at Newark Airport. There are still delays tonight because the visibility has been so bad. We saw that ground stop earlier at LaGuardia, now just delays there. You can see what it looked like in New York Monday. That's at the top. This is the progression. Top is Monday, bottom, that is what it looked like today. This is affecting a lot just beyond the flights. We're seeing code reds in multiple states. Schools up and down the East Coast canceling stuff like recess and after-school sports. MLB just postponed games tonight in both New York and Philly. The lead actor in a Broadway show stopped the performance 10 minutes in because it was so hard to breathe. The plumes of smoke are drifting down from up north, making it now a problem for people down from the Midwest to the Carolinas up into New England. We've got our team covering this from every angle. Meteorologist Bill Karens is with us. Tom Costello watching the flight situation. Emily Aketa is in New Jersey. I want to go to Emily first. And Emily, it looks like this is going to stick around, this terrible air quality, for at least another 24 hours. 
Yeah, that's right, Hallie. The plumes of smoke continue to smother cityscapes like, believe it or not, the one behind me. This is about the area of where you would typically see the Empire State Building, just completely obstructed by the massive and at times hazardous plumes of smoke. For the second day in a row, New York City air quality is considered some of the worst in the entire world. Governor Kathy Hochul just putting it and really putting things into perspective by describing how normally the air quality index in the state of New York is around 50. Well, now it has exceeded 400, and that's into hazardous territories. And that's why you're going to see so many people on the streets and roadways like me wearing this mask, because the onset of symptoms, they will come on quick. We're talking watery eyes, scratchy throat, headache, fatigue, and in some cases, difficulty breathing, especially for the more vulnerable populations uh, and people with respiratory conditions. I spoke with, We spoke with one doctor in the area who says she's already seeing an influx of asthmatic patients. Other vulnerable populations include seniors, young children, and expecting mothers. Here's what some people are doing uh, to take precautionary measures. Take a listen here. I'm not going anywhere. I was supposed to teach in Manhattan, um, you know, which involves a lot of walking around, waiting for the train, maybe waiting for a bus. Um, and it just didn't seem worth it today. And this is the result of smoke that has traveled hundreds of miles from those Canadian wildfires. Right now, more than 400 of them burning, more than 200 of them considered out of control. We know that U.S. personnel is on the ground there to contribute in the firefight as we see the effects continue to travel, again, hundreds of miles from the origin, Hallie. Emily Akata live for us there uh, just across the river where that skyline very tough to see behind you there from Hoboken. Emily, thank you. I want to bring in Tom Costello now problem now for airports, right? I mean, that's how extraordinarily bad this situation is. Talk to us about when things could start to look better. Tomorrow morning? Uh, it depends where you are. Maybe in the New York City area. Some of that's going to be a Bill Karen's question. But at the moment, we've got significant delays, and it is because of the smoke. We had a ground stop earlier today at LaGuardia. That's lifted, but we right now have a ground delay. Let me walk you through this. Uh, I mean, look at that. That's unbelievable, right? Newark Airport, 82-minute yeah. rights is the, is the typical delay right now on a ground delay. LaGuardia, two-hour delay right now. Philadelphia, 29 minutes. Uh, Teterboro, we rarely talk about. That's a private uh, airfield. Really, it's for private aircraft. They're at 45 minutes delays. And complicating matters, because it's never easy, uh, we've got ground stops in Dallas right now and in Denver because of thunderstorms. So the ripple effect is happening across the country. Top of, of top affected airports today in the United States, LaGuardia, no, no surprise, Newark, Charlotte, there's the ripple effect from the smoke, and also LaGuardia is an American Airlines base, so is Charlotte. Uh, listen, I count Toronto, major, major airport on the East Coast, right across the border. They're also on the list, as well as Reagan National here in Washington. And we do expect tomorrow that Washington's airports are going to be hit even harder as the smoke comes this way. Baltimore, Reagan, Dulles, and then moving on south through Virginia to the Carolinas. This is a significant problem. Uh, it's not unlike a significant weather event, rain event, snow, uh, and the ripple effect will extend into the uh, evening. Uh, total 3,200 delays right now nationwide, 145 cancellations. Tom Costello, thank you very much. You referenced meteorologist Bill Karen. So Tom laid out what it's going to look like from the sort of travel perspective. Bill, you're out in the streets. You're also in a mask. When is it going to get better for you from a health perspective? You usually forecast storms. Now you're forecasting smoke. Yeah, I think on Friday, people will start shedding the mask. I mean, what's changed in the last three hours since I was out here last was that I'd say about the number of people wearing masks has doubled. Word is kind of getting out there how unhealthy this air is to be breathing in. I'd say the visibility probably has increased a little bit uh, in the New York City area compared to like 2.30 when the worst of it was. But there's such fine particular matter that's in the air that we're breathing in. And that's why the health department is saying everyone should be putting on their mask. So as far as the forecast goes, right now, the worst of the smoke plume, the densest smoke, the most hazardous, is in over areas from central New York to Finger Lakes, northern Pennsylvania to Philadelphia to New York to Connecticut. Some of the worst air quality in the world right now is actually over Allentown, Pennsylvania. It's hazardous for anyone to go outside, let alone children, adults, or people with respiratory problems. And as we go through the forecast, we'll be watching this thick plume shifting a little bit to the south, weakening a little bit, so the air quality will be better tomorrow in New York, but not 
not great, still very unhealthy. And then as we go throughout, even Friday, we're still going to be watching plumes of smoke coming down. This time it'll be towards Buffalo. It looks like maybe even Pittsburgh will deal with it. And at times it'll be smoky from D.C. to New York. We will not see an apocalyptic scene like what we saw this afternoon in the New York City area, but we're still going to be plagued with these periods of uh, smoke as we go throughout the next couple of days. It's not until Saturday that we finally start to see this mess moving out of here. But yeah, I'll tell you, Hallie, you know, when I was out here for like three hours, even with an N95 mask, throat's a little itchy, eyes are a yeah, little watery. And uh, for, yeah, yeah, for anyone out here for an extended period of time, people working outside, I feel for them. Yeah, not everybody can avoid it so easily, right? There is also, as, as the New York City mayor has pointed out, a climate connection to this. Here's what he said. This may be the first time we've experienced something like this on this magnitude. Let's be clear. It is not the last. Talk about that piece of it, the connection to the climate crisis. We're used to seeing something like this in California. Not this bad, but wildfires generally. It's, it's new for the East Coast. We'll come back to that question uh, as Bill Karens is having some tech issues out there in New York. We hope that Bill stays safe, obviously, as does everybody else in the city and beyond. More coverage of that coming up later on tonight here on NBC News. But we want to take you to Iowa now, where Mike Pence is officially jumping into the race for the White House, going up against his former boss, Donald Trump, for the Republican nomination. The ex-VP trying to make the case that he's the right guy for the job, partly because of how he stood up to Mr. Trump's pressure campaign to try to get Pence to overturn the legitimate results of 2020. I believe that anyone who puts themselves over the Constitution should never be president of the United States. And anyone who asks someone else to put them over the Constitution should never be president of the United States again. He is serious about that message, right down to the rollout's Wi-Fi password. You see it here. Kept his oath. Question is, are voters serious about Mike Pence? Because with the caveat that it is still early days here, look at the numbers, right? Mike Pence is at just about 3%, hardly moved at all in the last six months. Dasha Burns is in Iowa for us tonight. Uh, empty room, Dasha, but Mike Pence is just getting on the campaign trail now officially, right? It's just starting, and so are the attacks against him. You already have a super PAC backing Donald Trump, saying that a lot of GOP voters are asking one question about Pence's candidacy, which is, why? So explain the why from the Pence team here and from Mike Pence. We heard some of it today. Well, look, Hallie, the why actually has to do with the issue that might be his biggest contrast with the former president and his biggest liability, and that is January 6th. In his address to voters today, he really went directly to that day, walked everyone through what happened, and laid down some of his sharpest criticisms yet of former President Trump, his former boss. Take a listen. President Trump was wrong then. And he's wrong now. I will always believe, by God's grace, I did my duty that day. I kept my oath to ensure the peaceful transfer of power under the Constitution of the United States. Look, this is an issue that the campaign knows looms over his candidacy. It might even loom over his legacy in the Republican Party overall. So the idea seems to be that the only way out is through. They have to take this mm -hmm. issue head on, and they might even be using it as a way to sort of bolster his conservative bona fides, his, his roots in constitutionalism, which is kind of what he laid out for voters here today. If he's going to do well anywhere in this Republican primary, it would be in Iowa, where you mm. are, right? He's talking about his Midwest connections yeah. today. He's probably going to look to connect with the religious right in Iowa as a man of deep faith himself. It seems like Team Pence knows that Iowa, in some ways, is ballgame for them. Yeah, it is Iowa or bust, Halley. He needs to do well here. And they see this as the most fertile ground for his kind of brand of traditional faith-based republicanism. And today, one of the other criticisms that he levied against his former boss was on the issue of abortion. Again, sort of playing towards that evangelical crowd, of which uh, there are a lot of evangelical vo voters here. He's hoping to connect on that faith-based approach. And on that issue of, of abortion, he said that the former president is sort of returning treating and questioned sort of his his move to the the left on on the issue here and again that's something that's really striking that he hasn't done before when it comes to his his uh his 
a former running mate and yeah. former boss. And the campaign does plan to go to all 99 counties in Iowa. They say they plan to visit all 70 plus pizza ranches here. That is going to be the approach, <laughs> Iowa or bust, Hallie. I, I feel like maybe you and I have both been to all 70 plus of those pizza ranches as well. Here's the thing, though, right? We talked about how Donald Trump is in some ways looking past Mike Pence already. Same with Ron DeSantis, who's down at the border in Arizona today for this quasi surprise trip. Mm -hmm. He is focused on going after the current president, President Biden. Listen. You're the president. You would think that you would take a sense of pride in ensuring that the territorial integrity of your country is actually respected. Those close to Donald Trump are going after DeSantis for this, saying that he's the one who can't be trusted to secure the border. It seems like that is the broader play here on both sides, to bring it back mm -hmm. to a Donald Trump versus Ron DeSantis showdown in this primary. Yeah, Hallie, you know I've been following uh, Governor DeSantis a lot, too, mm -hmm. and I have not heard him really talk about any other candidates except former President Trump and, of course, President Joe Biden. He's, his campaign sees this as a two-man race, and when I talk to voters, those are really the only two names that come up, Trump and DeSantis. To be fair to all the other candidates, though, it's very early, and we know a lot say. can happen even before the first uh, the Iowa caucuses here, Hallie. We simply cannot issue that caveat enough, especially when it is early uh, summer, late spring of 2023. Dasha Burns, thank you very much. Appreciate it. We've got some more breaking political news just coming into us in truly the last few minutes right here at NBC News Now. Steve Bannon, that name is probably familiar to you. You see him here. He's been a longtime ally of former President Donald Trump. He, we've confirmed, has been subpoenaed now in that special counsel investigation into Mr. Trump's connection to the January 6th attack on the Capitol. This is according to two sources familiar with that, talking with NBC News. I want to bring in now Garrett Hake, who is joining us uh, to talk about this and some other developments as it relates to Trump world. Let me talk about, Garrett, sort of this first piece, the Bannon subpoena here. Um, what, what does it mean? What does it tell us about any potential charges that could come against Donald Trump? Well, remember, Steve Bannon was long since out of the White House proper by that uh, by the time the January 6th rolled around or by the 2020 election in general. But he was never out of the Trump orbit. He was always a big booster for Donald Trump. He was a big booster for the Stop the Steal movement, both on his podcast and in public appearances. And he was somebody who kind of revved up the Trump base, both in the lead up to January 6th and around that time period in general to help raise money. And so the universe of things that the special counsel may want to ask him about is pretty broad. What did he know? about the lead up to January 6th. Remember his famous quote that, you know, the, the day was going to be wild and he kind of like, you know, set the tone for January 6th himself. But then also, what did he know about the efforts to continue to raise money to overturn the election results or to challenge election results long after it was clear that there was really no legal basis to do so? Um, you know, they knew this, pro this uh, subpoena went out in May. I don't believe we know whether or not, uh, you know, kind of how deep down the rabbit hole right. the prosecutors went with Steve Bannon, but he's got a lot potentially to share. And remember, this is somebody who fought uh, and was held in contempt uh, the January 6th committee's effort to get him to testify. So we really haven't heard kind of his version of this story at all yet. Two buckets here, Garrett. The Steve Bannon stuff, apparently, according to the sources that we have here at NBC News, relates to the January 6th piece of the special right. counsel investigation. The special counsel is also looking at this issue of mishandling of classified documents, whether Donald Trump knowingly brought stuff he shouldn't have from the White House that was classified down to Mar-a-Lago. There's a lot of swirl in that bucket, right, of this special counsel investigation, so much so that the former president himself is posting late today, nobody, I want to read it here if we can pull it up, essentially, nobody has told me that I'm getting indicted. Well, nobody said that officially or publicly at all, but it does seem to be an indication that pressure is perhaps building. Yeah, look, Hallie, the theme of the day is smoke, right? And there's a whole lot of smoke here for a fire that we can't quite see yet about the possibility yeah. of an indictment on this classified documents uh, bucket, to borrow your metaphor here. And exactly what the charges might be or who all might get indicted is not really clear at this point. But every available sign that we have is that these negotiate this uh, investigation appears to be wrapping up right down to, to me, the biggest one, which is that meeting on Monday with uh, Donald Trump's attorneys and DOJ officials, including Jack Smith. 
Smith. They had wanted to go in and talk to uh, Merrick Garland himself. They wanted to complain about the way the investigation was being run and probably to uh, you know raise their issues with the indictment more broadly. That alone is a trigger to me that this investigation is close to the end. But the public comments from Donald Trump kind of digging in politically is a, is a big callback to what we saw with the indictment in New York and a sign right. that he it does expect something to happen here soon. Garrett Haig, busy few days for you uh, and your team. Really appreciate it. Tonight, a suspect's in custody, pleading not guilty to murder charges in that shooting after a high school graduation ceremony in Virginia just about 24 hours ago, as we are getting a new look at the really scary moments right as it happened. Watch. Oh, you hear the gunshots going off. You see people starting to run. They'd been celebrating. That happens. You see the phone drop. People try to get somewhere safe. The panic starts to build there. Five people were hurt. Two people were killed. The victims, a father and son, Sean Jackson, and his dad, Renzo Smith. You see them here. Smith's sister telling NBC News he had a heart of gold. And Jackson, he was only 18. He had just graduated. This is him in an Instagram video walking across stage during the ceremony just minutes before this shooting. Police say this was a targeted attack. His mom telling us she'd been swelling with pride on that graduation day yesterday because her son had overcome so much to get there. Something the school district's superintendent echoed. Getting to the graduation stage was not easy for Sean. Nonetheless, he did it. And he was rightly proud, smiling, and celebrating like all of his peers. Aaron Gilcrest joins me now. Aaron, um, Jackson's mom says the family got separated in the crowd right before the shooting happened. You are there outside the theater at the location of this. What, what else are we learning now? Well, Hallie, as we understand it from the police chief here, the suspect in this uh, incident, 19-year-old Damari Pollard, was inside the theater watching the graduation ceremony as it happened today. After the ceremony ended, he came outside, according to police, and exchanged words, they said, with, uh, with the young man who had just graduated, who died here, Sean Jackson. Uh, at, at some point after that exchange, police say Pollard went to his car, retrieved a handgun, came back, and started shooting. Uh, as you noted, seven people were wounded here, or seven people were shot here, two people died, uh, Jackson and his stepfather. Uh, and this was a chaotic scene that sent people running in all directions. Several people tried to run back into the theater to get away from the gunfire. It was described as a stampede here. I want you to hear a little bit of what the mayor had to say today about what happened here and what needs to happen moving forward. I know many are overcome with grief, and I know that many are very angry right now. Well, let me be clear to Richmonders. We will heal, we will recover, and this will not break us. There were hundreds of people outside the theater here and in the park across the street after the ceremony. Hallie, as you noted, taking pictures, uh, hugging each other, celebrating this special day for these young people. That incident now marred, and there's going to be a long road to recovery for the hundreds of people who witnessed what happened here after that graduation ceremony yesterday. Can you tell us more about what police are describing as this sort of, what they say, ongoing dispute in this instance here? We know that this is a shooting that has affected the community very deeply. School um, activities are canceled in Richmond Public Schools, several of them. Um, but talk to us about this piece related to this suspect who you've just described and, and the victims here. Yeah, police say that the suspect and the victim who died here, the young man who died here, knew each other. They had had at least a year-long dispute, the police chief said, uh, going on here. And so today, it, or rather yesterday, it culminated with that confrontation outside the theater here and ultimately ended in the shooting. Police are still investigating. They're asking the public to share any video that they may have taken during the time out here uh, yesterday. They're still trying to piece together exactly what happened and try to get a better understanding of why this happened, which is the same for so many families out here. Hallie, I can tell you, I, I'm a Richmond Public Schools graduate. Uh, my sister graduated in this building right behind me here. Wow. Uh, this is not something that people for generations who graduated in this building would ever expect to see. And so it's going to take some time for this community to come to grips with what's happened and to heal. Aaron Gilchrist, thank you so much for your perspective and for your reporting there live from Richmond. Appreciate it.
Pope Francis overseas out of surgery tonight and recovering at a hospital in Rome after a procedure to fix a hernia. The Vatican says no complications, with the Pope set to stay in the hospital for a few days to recover. This is the second time he's been hospitalized in just over two months. And that's bringing up some new questions about how he's doing health-wise generally. Before he headed to the hospital, you see it here, Pope Francis held his weekly general audience as scheduled. There he is in St. Peter's Square. But everything else on his plate is on hold for at least another 10 days or so. Megan Fitzgerald is joining us now live from Rome. Not necessarily, Megan, an emergency surgery, but it is a serious surgery, especially for somebody who's in his mid-80s. We've laid out the Pope has had medical issues before. Talk us through this. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, so right now, he's going to remain in the hospital, as you mentioned. Uh, he's being told he's got to stay there to recover, to rest. He's being told not to do any heavy lifting. lifting. Uh, but what we know, Hallie, is that the Pope has been in some serious pain over the last several months because of this hernia that formed on this scar, presumably from the surgery that he had uh, in 2021. Keep in mind, doctors say that's not uncommon to see at all. Uh, in fact, we had an opportunity to hear from his surgeon earlier today. I want to to listen to a little bit of what he had to say. Surgical operation and the general anesthesia were well tolerated by the Pope. Now he's awake, he's fine, and he's already at work. All right, so let's talk recent chronology of events for the Pope. We know that yesterday uh, he went to the hospital, he had some tests. He went back to the Vatican uh, where he presided over his audience. Uh, and then we saw a similar thing today. Uh, and he even held meetings before going to the hospital um, where he had the surgery today. But look, this is a Pope that has struggled with health issues over the last several years. We know that in 2021, like we mentioned, he had that surgery on his colon where some 13 inches of his colon was removed. Uh, we know that he suffers with He's had these flare-ups, uh, causing him uh, great pain to miss some uh, events, uh, and also, which is why he uses the wheelchair. In March, we saw him suffer with bronchitis. He was hospitalized for a couple of days, and then, of course, he brings us to today for this recent surgery. But again, doctors say he's doing well, Hallie, and he is ready to get back to work. What about the schedule coming up, right? Because he's supposed to go to Portugal. He's supposed to go to Mongolia later this summer. That is linked now to speculation uh, separately, right? Backdrop, speculation of retirement. What's the word on that? Yeah, you're absolutely right, and that is the big question here. We've heard a lot from the Pope over the course of several years that he's been the Pope. He said that he was only going to serve for a couple of years in the beginning. Then he said that if his health started to fail, that he would consider retiring, stepping down. Uh, but most recently, he has said that this is a life mission. So if you go off of what he's recently saying, it certainly does appear as though he's going to stay Pope until the end, Holly. Megan Fitzgerald, thank you very much. Live for us in Rome. Appreciate it. To Ukraine now with new concerns tonight after a key dam collapsed in the southern region of that country, putting something like 100,000 people at risk with deadly consequences. Three big concerns here. First, evacuations, especially in the city of Kherson. The chief of staff to President Zelensky says today the situation there is the most difficult. Another concern, the U.S. is warning of the risk of possible diseases being spread by some of the chemicals now in the water. Third thing, people who are stuck Getting them clean drinking water. They don't have it. This is a video you're seeing on the right side of your screen of a drone delivering a bottle of water to somebody. And now the mayor in the town of the, when one town rather in the region, confirming that multiple people have died because of the flooding. We don't know the number yet, but obviously this is incredibly significant. There's a big impact on wildlife too. Hundreds of dead fish lining the banks of this reservoir because there's so little water left after that collapse. Both Russia and Ukraine are pointing the finger at each other for having caused it. Josh Letterman is joining us now. Talk us through the latest, Josh. Well, one of the key concerns right now that the Ukrainians are expressing, Hallie, is the fact that they're not even able to help all of the Ukrainians who are currently in harm's way. Because remember, this is contested territory. I spent a lot of time on the banks of the Dnipro River uh, last year, and especially downstream of uh, the river, uh, in the area downstream of where this dam collapsed, 
the, the river itself is basically the front line. You've got Ukrainian-held territory on one side, Russian-held territory on the other, which means you've got massive flooded areas that are under Russian control. In fact, the dam itself was under Russian control. And so tonight, we're hearing from the prime minister of Ukraine, Denis Shmyl, saying, look, we can't help all of these people who are in Russian-held territory. It's up to the International Red Cross. It's up to the United Nations and other uh, non-governmental organizations. Please help those individuals in the areas that we simply cannot reach. And so that is sort of the backdrop right now is this massive humanitarian effort is underway that frankly resembles what you might see in the aftermath of a hurricane where we often cover the efforts to get clean water and sanitation kits, hygiene supplies to people in need, except for the fact that all of this is happening in the middle of a war zone with ongoing shelling reported even in the very areas where emergency workers are trying to reach those who may be in harm's way, not just because of the shelling, but because of these rising waters. And we're also hearing tonight from the Red Cross, which is expressing a concern about an entire different type of danger, landmines. They say that they had done a good job before this dam collapsed of mapping out where the landmines were because they wanted to try to demine areas of Ukraine. They say now many of those landmines have completely washed away from where they were located earlier. It is anybody's guess where those landmines might have ended up when those floodwaters were surging down the Dnieper River, which means there could be people who are in harm's way from landmines who have absolutely no idea. Allie. Coming up, new details tonight after the arrest of an actor from Bob's Burgers, what the DOJ says he did on January 6th. Plus, a big win for Batman in court. We'll explain in the global. A Taco Bell menu icon going vegan. That's coming up in our five things. But first tonight, shares of CNN's parent company are up something like 8% after that pretty stunning leadership twist. Chris Licht officially out as the head of the news organization after one year as chairman and CEO. His departure comes as there is a lot on CNN's plate. They've been dealing with shrinking profits, lower ratings, which reportedly dipped below Newsmax in the days after that town hall with Donald Trump last month. And then most recently, that damning article in The Atlantic calling Lick's leadership into question. It dropped only five days ago, and now here we are, licked out. After revealing his mission to, I'm quoting here, restore the network's reputation for serious journalism, the article, written by Tim Alberta, asks, how did it all go wrong? Listen, this is a move from CNN that matters, right, on the leadership structure, not just for CNN, but for the broader industry. Because Lick's departure, after his reported attempts to move the news brand to the political center, raises new questions about where CNN goes. Remember, a cable news network once seen as a pioneer and a hallmark in this world. The CEO of CNN's parent company saying in a statement, quote, in part, the job of leading CNN was never going to be easy. Stephanie Gosk joins us now. Steph, I'm going to just be super honest with you. Yeah. I think this is, this is like an interesting story for us to cover because it runs the risk of being really navel-gazy. We all know people yeah. who work at CNN. We all know what CNN, we work in this media industry. But there is um, like a relevant impact to people who simply consume perhaps broadcast news, cable news, streaming news, as it relates to the fall of Chris Licht in this particular position. Yeah, for sure, Hallie. And, and listen, the, like it or not, the media has become part of our national conversation. And it, people care about it. And they want to know where they're going to get their news from. And, and this effort to move CNN towards the middle, after what a lot of people saw as a real partisan turn during the Trump years, deserves some analysis. But also, you have to look at the controversies that played out over the course of the 13 months that Lick was there, the most important of which really was the revamping of that morning show. And what he did did in the morning was he took Poppy Harlow, a, a veteran at CNN, along with Caitlin Collins, an up and rising um, former White House correspondent, and put them with Don Lemon, a real lightning rod in their primetime lineup. They had a tough time right out of the gate, and then Lemon said some disparaging things about women during a live broadcast, and he, eventually he was out. The other thing to look at that happened that, that Licht was very much involved in was that Donald Trump town hall that really kind of turned into to a rally. You had Caitlin Collins trying to monitor it. And 
and it kind of went off the rails. And you had a whole bunch of really staunch Trump supporters cheering him on. And he repeated a lot of the same things that we've been hearing about election fraud that are totally unverified and went kind of unchecked over the course of that period of time. Then comes this Atlantic article with unbelievable access, really, to Chris Licht over an extensive period of time. Uh, and now the announcement today that he's out. Stephanie Gosk, a lot to watch, lots to follow. As you point out, broader impact on this. We'll watch to see what happens. Thank you, friend. Appreciate it. You're welcome. Let's get you over to the five things our team thinks you should know about tonight. Number one, an update to a story we told you about 24 hours ago. Florida police, it turns out, have now arrested the white woman accused of shooting her black neighbor through a door last week and killing her. She's facing a number of charges, including manslaughter with a firearm. Officials are not sure when she's going to make her first court appearance. Number two, the Missouri governor just signing a bill banning gender-affirming care for kids and some adults. Once the law goes into effect later this summer, doctors are not going to be able to prescribe puberty blockers or hormones or surgeries to patients under 18. It also removes Medicaid coverage for those treatments for adults. The law will expire, however, in 2027 as part of a compromise with Democrats. Number three, an actor from Bob's Burgers in Arrested Development was just arrested in connection to the January 6th attack on the Capitol. We're talking about Jay Johnston. This is him. Charged with felony obstruction of officers, among other things. Prosecutors say he stole a Capitol Police officer's shield and used it as rioters battled with police. Number four, Prince Harry wrapping up an hours-long cross-examination today, getting emotional toward the end of testimony, telling court it's been a lot. He took the stand in his lawsuit against the publishers of the Daily Mirror, a tabloid there, over accusations they illegally hacked this voicemail. Remember, he's now the first member of the royal family to testify in court in more than a century. Number two, a Taco Bell menu icon now going vegan, a new version of the Crunchwrap Supreme getting rolled out at some of these Taco Bells. It's made with this like proprietary plant-based protein thing, some vegan sauces. If you're in New York City, LA, or Orlando, you can get them starting tomorrow. Everybody else, you shall have to wait for your vegan taco. When we come back, the prime suspect in Natalie Holloway's disappearance set to be brought back to the U.S. maybe as soon as tomorrow. We're taking a closer look at the case everybody's heard about and asking the question, what happens with Jorn van der Sloot's extradition as he's fighting it next? Tonight, the main suspect in one of the most high-profile disappearances ever is fighting his extradition to the U.S., an extradition that is supposed to happen in just the next 24 hours. We're talking about the guy you see here, Jorn van der Sloot, one of the last people seen with Natalie Holloway before she disappeared while on a high school graduation trip to Aruba back in 2005. He faces fraud charges for a case connected to Holloway's disappearance. Remember, it's her story that captivated so many people in this country, dominated headlines for months, with so many questions still not answered nearly 20 years later. Wad Venegas explains it for us in tonight's breakdown. It was a case that gripped the nation. There is still no sign of Natalie Holloway. Natalie Holloway has been missing. New help in the search for missing teenager Natalie Holloway. Alabama teenager Natalie Holloway, only 18 years old, mysteriously vanished on her high school graduation trip to Aruba almost two decades ago. A chilling case that is still unsolved. The story of her 2005 disappearance captured worldwide attention, covering magazines, sparking documentaries, and even being turned into dramatic movies. Her cell phone. She doesn't have a with her. Police say this man, Joran van der Sloot, was with Holloway the night she vanished. He was arrested twice and then released both times, but never charged in her disappearance. Holloway was officially declared dead years later in 2012. Her body never found. But her mother, Beth Holloway, never stopped searching. I will pursue this with every ounce of energy that I have. And Vandersloot is the man she blames for her daughter's death. He was later arrested and convicted for the murder of a different woman in Peru, where he's serving a 28-year sentence. But he's said to be extradited to the U.S. soon, not for any murder charges, but in connection to a fraud case. Extradition is just a process where one jurisdiction asks another jurisdiction to turn over someone in that other jurisdiction. Vandersloot's lawyer says he's fighting the extradition. 
It's alleged he led Holloway's mother to wire $25,000 to him in exchange for information on where Natalie's body was and details on her death. The accusation says Vanderslew claimed to know the site in Aruba where Holloway's remains were buried, but federal prosecutors say that's a lie. An FBI agent says Vandersloot's plot involved trying to get a quarter of a million dollars from Holloway's grieving mother. But Vandersloot's lawyer tells NBC News Vandersloot is actually the one who was tricked. He says Natalie's mother, alongside a journalist, promised Vandersloot they'd give him $250,000. Beth Holloway's spokesperson tells NBC News the allegations are, quote, patently untrue. In a recent statement, Natalie's mother, writing in part, quote, it has been a very long and painful journey, but the persistence of many is going to pay off. Together, we are finally getting justice for Natalie. The case, once again, set to capture headlines around the world decades later. Guad Venegas is joining us now live from Peru. Okay, Guad, as you report now, Jorn Vandersloot's lawyer is trying to make sure he is not actually extradited. That is supposed to happen within the next 24 hours. How does this get resolved? What is going to happen? It is, Hallie. So according to government officials here in Peru, the extradition is set to happen tomorrow, June 8th. Uh, June 8th. He is currently at a detention center north of Lima. He was transferred from the maximum security prison where he was serving that 28-year sentence. Just days ago, he was brought to the Lima area. All of this to move forward with the extradition. So as of now, according to Peruvian officials, he will be extradited to face these charges in the United States. That could happen at any point uh, tomorrow. So we will be here paying attention, Hallie, uh, to witness that extradition. He's expected to be driven from that detention center to the Lima airport and from there be flown to Alabama, where he will face uh, the fraud and extradition uh, charges, Hallie. Guad Venegas live for us there in Lima. Guad, glad to have you there. Thank you very much for that reporting. New reaction tonight in just the last hour from the governor of California after a fight between demonstrators outside a school board meeting where they were voting on whether or not to recognize June as Pride Month. A pretty pro forma declaration, but boy, what happened outside was anything but normal. You had people pushing each other, police in Glendale trying to break it up a few times. Nobody got hurt, but three people were arrested. Now, the governor of California is saying in a statement, what should have been a routine vote, simply recognizing Pride Month for the fourth year in a row, turned to violence. The words of the resolution did not change, Newsom says, from years past. But what has changed is a wave of division and demonization sweeping our nation. The board eventually unanimously voted to recognize Pride Month. I want to bring in Miguel Almaguer, who's been following all the developments for us here tonight. And Miguel, it feels like Governor Newsom is getting at one of the central points to this, which is this was a fairly routine resolution that the school board was passing because they'd already passed it for years, right? This wasn't new. This wasn't the first time. How did things get yeah. so sparked off? Well, initially, police say the gathering started out peacefully. Protesters and LGBTQ activists had gathered outside that school board meeting after both sides called for groups to show up on social media. Police say agitators on, quote, both sides got out of hand, and that escalated into fighting. It appears punches were thrown, and folks who were on the ground were kicked. As you mentioned, three people were arrested, and later, after declaring an unlawful assembly, everyone cleared out of that area, according to police. Now, the school board said, the curriculum they teach is mandated by state law, and they've been teaching it for more than a decade. Here's what they say. It should be clear. When you're placing your kids in taxpayer-funded public school, it should be clear what they're getting educated on. If there is concern with that, they're barking up the wrong tree here, disrupting the movement of what is happening in Glendale Unified School District. The school district says they are shocked by the protest and disappointed that it happened, Hallie. It's not just Glendale, right? Miguel, I mean, it, it, we've been talking, and you and I have talked about this for weeks, if not longer, months, right, leading up to Pride Month, the way that um, there are now flashpoints in the business world, in the corporate world. We're now seeing flashpoints at this school board meeting and in, in, the, in the arena of education, too. 
Yeah, that's right. Well, in Glendale and many other cities where protests have broken out, officials say it's misinformation that is driving so many of these protests, misinformation about what's being taught or even celebrated. But this is also a hot button issue with culture wars underway. It seems pride events in cities nationwide have been under attack. In fact, the Human Rights Campaign declared a state of emergency for LGBTQ communities, citing the current political climate, Hallie. Miguel Almaguer, live for us out there in California. Miguel, thanks for being out there for us tonight. Coming up, an incredibly emotional opening day in the trial of a former Florida deputy accused of failing to confront the shooter at Parkland High School. We'll tell you what a former student said on the stand and who walked out. In a Florida courtroom today, some incredibly emotional scenes. Families of victims visibly shaken up, one even walking out while listening to the sound of shots fired that day, listening to the sound of kids screaming. They're all there in court for the trial of this man, Scott Peterson. He's the former school resource deputy who was on duty during that shooting five years ago. Peterson's accused of failing to follow his training and confront the attacker by staying in a covered position for something like 45 minutes. 14 students and three staffers were killed. In that attack, you see their names and their faces here. The state's first witness today was a former student, Danielle Gilbert. She was a junior at the time. Did you know that Deputy C. Peterson carried a firearm? I did, yes. Did Deputy Peterson ever enter your classroom that day? He did not. Did he ever enter the hallway? He did not. Did you ever see Deputy Peterson assist any students that day? I did not. Lindsay Reiser joins me now. Lindsay, in the five years since the Parkland school shooting happened, Scott Peterson has been in many ways at the epicenter of the intense criticism for not doing more sooner. This was a huge headline in the weeks and months after the attack. And this trial has enormous implications, Hallie. Yeah. We're going to show you the charges that he's facing right now. We've got seven counts of child neglect, three counts of culpable negligence, one count of perjury. He's accused of lying to officials. And according to the Association of School Resource Officers, they believe this is the first case of its kind in which an officer in the U.S. is being tried for allegedly not acting in a school shooting. And so prosecutors allege, we know that Scott Peterson was the only one on Marjorie Stoneman Douglas campus in 20. 2018 with a handgun. They allege that instead of going to the building to apprehend the shooter, to confront the shooter, he hid sort of in an alcove behind a wall. For about 48 minutes, he stayed there. And so they allege that his action, or rather inaction, um, led to potential harm by these victims, that he could have prevented more bloodshed. We know 17 people, as you mentioned, died and 17 more were wounded. His defense attorney is essentially saying he's thrown under the bus. They're calling him a scapegoat for the sheriff's office, um, basically covering up um, uh, potential mistakes on their own end. And he also says that he did what he was trained to do, that he thought there were, uh, there were actually shots coming from outside, potentially a sniper. He didn't know where the shots were coming from. And so he said he did what he was trained to do, and that is seek cover. But the prosecution, Hallie, is going to have to prove that he knew those shots were coming from inside that school and that his action or inaction possibly led to more harm. Just incredibly emotional, Lindsay. I mean, the, the audio that was played, what these people who came to court, right, victims, family members of victims had to hear, uh, it's, it's just, it's a gut punch. Yet another gut punch five years later. It's excruciating. It is so hard to listen to. Some people had earplugs in, and you can still sort of tell in some of that audience reaction, they could maybe still hear some of it because their their heads were in their hands. I mean, of yeah. course, it is traumatizing to listen to these children screaming. Um, that first witness that we heard from, who was a student at the time, she said that several students were shot in her classroom. One died. Kids were trying to use their, their uh, some kind of clothes and coats to try and stop the bleeding and that in the she took an audio recording there and all of that chaos and you can hear students um, trying to be quiet but they are just so so distraught of course and you hear one student saying please help me um, and then in some of the audio that was played in court today that was tough to listen to you can hear the gunshots you can hear just blood piercing screams Hallie and uh, we also heard testimony from a teacher who described the gunshots just being deafening and just completely um, obliterating the classroom. And we also heard from a law enforcement official who 
said um, th that people are trained in these on-campus shootings to run toward the danger, to run toward the shooter, not away from it. In fact, saying if you hear gunshots, someone's getting killed. So very powerful testimony today, Hallie. Both opening statements have wrapped. It's still the prosecution's turn tomorrow. Lindsay Reiser, so many people were living that nightmare from five years ago again today. Thank you. NBC News covers hundreds of international stories every day. And because you couldn't possibly read or watch or listen to them all, our foreign desk has done it for you. Here's some of what they're watching in a segment we call The Global. The Secretary of State, Tony Blinken, meeting with the Saudi Crown Prince, Mohammed bin Salman. A significant moment, a significant meeting between the two of them because things have been tense between the two countries over issues like Iran and oil. President Biden met with MBS, as he's called, last summer. Out of Switzerland, people were briefly allowed back into a village that got evacuated last month because of the threat of a rock slide. Some of the hundred or so people who live there only got about 90 minutes in shifts to go back into their homes, get what they needed, and get out. Still an open question as to whether they'll be able to go home for good. And out of Luxembourg, a victory in court for Batman. The EU's general court saying today that Batman's logo is distinctive enough to get its own trademark in the, in the EU. There had been a clothing company in Italy that wanted the EU to get rid of the trademark for stuff like clothes and carnival items. So yay, Batman, although that clothing company can appeal. We'll see. Still to come here on the show. Officials in Hawaii warning of dangerous air quality, not because of those wildfires we talked about at the top of the show, but because of what you're seeing on screen, that dramatic eruption. We're going to talk about it in just a sec. I want to show you some live pictures you're looking at as we speak. Take a peek here in just a sec. You're going to see the lava at Kilauea, the volcano on Hawaii's Big Island. That is a live look at it at Volcanoes National Park. Look at all that smoke. Look at the, you can see it, right, glowing right in the middle of your screen. The initial eruption, that has been even more dramatic, right? Look at that. The smoke, the lava shooting up from the crater into the sky. You can see it's dark out. It happened really early in the morning in Hawaii. This, what you're looking at, this is why the alert level on the Big Island has been raised from a watch to a warning. It's not because of the lava flow itself. It's all kind of contained. You can see it. It's kind of like this fiery cauldron in the crater of Kilauea. The national park that it's in is closed, so nobody lives there, right? It's not a threat to property necessarily, but there could be a threat to people's health. The concern about, for example, air quality, maybe the damage to crops and livestock because of how much volcanic gas is in the air. Dana Griffin is joining us now. It's not like the movies, Dana. It's not like the lava's flowing out and like racing down the side of the mountain to go burn people's homes up. But there is an air quality threat, very different from what we're dealing yeah. with on the East Coast here, but a threat nonetheless. Absolutely. And as you described it, that cauldron of lava that overflowed, it is kind of spectacular to see it. But the good thing is, according to officials, that at this point, there is no threat to the public. But there is a concern, according to the National Weather Service, for light ashfall, also the volcanic gases that could be pushed because of those trade winds. So just like, you know, the Canadian wildfire um, uh, smoke that you guys are experiencing in the Northeast, that could be what some people are experiencing in Hawaii. I want to pull up this graphic just showing a little bit of history of the Kilauea uh, volcano. It has had 61 eruptions since 1823. In 2018, the eruption there and the summit collapse was the largest in centuries where you may remember more than 700 homes were destroyed. Now, the communications director for the Hawaii Emergency Management Agency says that this eruption that happened this morning is not developing the way that we saw in 2018. So that's the good news, but they are keeping a very close eye. Now, the very latest eruption at Kilauea was January 5th. That lasted 61 days. So that could possibly give you an indication of how long this one could last. Uh, officials say they anticipate an influx of visitors to the National Volca Volcano uh, Park because people are curious to see this up close as long as it is safe. And they anticipate that plane tickets could sell out from those smaller I islands to the bigger island as people try to get up close and personal to, again, a very spectacular site. One local reporter there who says that he's been covering volcanoes for the last five years says he has never experienced anything like this. It sounds like a jet engine, a jet engine and you can feel just 
the rumble from that eruption. Hallie? It is incredible to look at. Dana Griffin, thank you very much. That does it for us for this hour and the one before it. We've got more coverage picking up with Top Story right now. Thanks for watching our YouTube channel. Follow today's top stories and breaking news by downloading the NBC News app.